I want to start this evening by introducing Joan King Salwin. Joan had two successful careers before coming to Stanford as a distinguished career fellow and most recently founding Elm Innovations. She was a managing director at Accenture and then the head of a college prep girls school. Joan's awareness of her connection to the earth came at an early age. She grew up in Iowa in the long shadow of a multi-generational family farm. And as a girl, Joan spent days walking and weeding fields and harvesting and preserving their bounty. She is currently a visiting scholar at Stanford in the School of Earth, and she leads a team exploring how to mitigate the environmental effect of livestock farming. Also here with us today is Kat Taylor. Kat received her bachelor's uh, from Harvard and her JD MBA from Stanford. She's a champion of social justice and environmental well-being and advocates in accordance with her personal doctrine, good, good money, good food, and good energy. Kat launched the innovative Tomcat Ranch and Educational Foundation in Pescadero. She's also the co-founder and co-CEO of Beneficial State Bank, an Oakland-based community development financial institution whose mission is to bring beneficial banking to low-income communities in an economically and environmentally sustainable manner. And she's also the co-founder and managing partner of Radical Impact, a fund that partners with exceptional people to build businesses where financial success creates meaningful social change. To us here at Stanford, she is a Tomcat Center and a Steyer Taylor Center founding benefactor. So it is with great enthusiasm that I welcome them and thank them for coming this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming them. So I'm going to um, ask you, each of you some questions. And um, I want to jump straight into a topic where you both have aligned interests. Um, we often hear about the extremely negative impact of livestock, particularly in terms of its environmental impact. Could you each speak to how some of the innovations you are championing can address some of these concerns? Uh, Kat, maybe we'll start with you. Maybe you could also speak to soil improvement and carbon sequestration from the perspective of the Tomcat Ranch and restorative land management. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having us here. Um, and I really look forward to hearing the next panel for the next generation of entrepreneurs. So um, my husband, Tom Steyer, and I took an approach to philanthropy that really isn't philanthropy at all. It's, uh, it has more to do with risk capital and experimentation. And we wanted to work at the systems level because a, a lot of uh, solution sets fail for not taking a holistic approach looking at the way cycles and dynamics are interdependent. We can't cover the whole landscape, and we tried to have some focus. My husband would prefer linear focus, but I'm uh, an ethereal space case. So we settled, <laughs> <laughs> we settled on three areas of focus, good food, good money, good energy. And we created operating entities at the heart of each of those so that we would have the insights of real actors in the system. Make no mistake, we're not livelihood actors. Our family's uh, health and well-being doesn't depend on any of those companies. And so in a sense, I'm not sitting in the same shoes of somebody who's truly seeking risk capital for entrepreneurial activity. But we do take risks, and we do try to experiment in ways that de-risk activities for other actors in the system. So at the heart of good money sits the bank, Beneficial State Bank. It's about a billion dollars in assets. Uh, with 17 branch offices in the West Coast and 260 employees. And it's really trying to prove that we can run banking as a quasi-public system that redounds social justice and environmental well-being in equal measure to financial sustainability. Um, on the energy side, my husband started NextGen and a variety of other nonprofits and uh, political organizations trying to reactivate democracy by the people instead of by the dollars. Um, at the heart of the good food work is Tomcat Ranch, which is a 2,000-acre cattle ranch on, in Pescadero, 50 miles south of San Francisco in a coastal environment. Um, and that's really what, what we're going to talk about today, I think, is what are the insights of that ranch in terms of how we treat our food system. Um, uh, human beings have evolved with grasslands more than any other environment. And those grasslands have always been populated by ungulates. That's, it's the ungulates that are codependent upon the grasslands, and they uh, create the ecosystem that benefits both. So ungulates are the most efficient converters of solar energy to muscle mass, which is really protein. 
Uh, and the way they do that is by eating grasses and having the ruminant stomachs in order to convert uh, those very complex carbohydrates to sugars and therefore their own energy and their own growth. Um, so what we were trying to do is not take the industrial agricultural system that I grew up uh, in as a 59-year-old person as, uh, as something that's just de facto, that's what we pass as prologue, we'll always have that, but really kind of pick it apart and see where we came off the rails, because we coexisted with grasslands and ungulates for a very long time. Many more ungulates that are likely on the, uh, and historically, than are currently on the planet. So it isn't them per se that are bad for environment, but it's some way we sit in relationship to them that's gone askew. And it likely has to do with the scaling of industrial agriculture. I think still about 70% of agricultural activities are livelihood-based, meaning small scale, uh, for, for single proprietor kinds of, of farm operations in the world. And um, at that scale, we're not running into the real problems, which have to do more likely with mass till, with a an inappropriate approach to soils, uh, and the uh, basically the confined animal factory operation approach, approach to livestock, where they're very detached from their natural setting. Uh, so. Um, soils relate deeply to this, uh, not only because they're super important to us, they are basically our most important natural commons. Uh, we feed the world with healthy soils. Uh, we have enough uh, food in the world uh, based on the land mass that we have to feed the world, but we have extreme problems of the quality of the food and the distribution or the location of the food. But if you think about historic times, the antecedents to all our deep bread baskets of the world, the most prolific agricultural lands, are the sites of the great animal migrations. And that's really the key to soil development. So if you think of the Serengeti, you had multi-species herds with all sorts of other species, non-mammalian, uh, non like birds in particular, uh, that were drawn through an annual cycle by the rains. The rains were what uh, inspired uh, the annual growth of grasses. Most of them were perennials, not annuals. Uh, the, the symphony that happened to create those soils is really a very beautiful one, and that's what we're trying to replicate at Tomcat Ranch. So as the rains start, the animals are bunched together. They have learned through natural selection to have their young all in one season of the year. So either spring or fall, typically, they drop all their babies. It's confusion to the enemy. Predators can't pick off as many of the young if they happen all at once. Once the animals, the baby animals are ambulatory, which is for a cow, day one, they start the migration following the rains, really following the grasses. Bunched together, they keep more of their young uh, and their units alive, their unit numbers alive, because it's hard to pick off the animals on the interior. And they move very rapidly to stay ahead of the predators. That creates a, a disturbance, a disruption of the grasslands. It's very beneficial for the grasses, because they're eating uh, just a light grazing, uh, clipping off the tops of all those perennial grasses, not getting to the growing shoot and moving on. So uh, how that translates into our ranch setting is we're trying to give our grasslands maximum days rest, but absolutely need that disturbance. If you don't have the disturbance, you have a single growth. And in our setting, if we don't have the disturbance, we'd never open up the perennial seed bank because the annuals grow fast, and they crowd out the perennials from the resources, sun and water that they need. Those animals move along at a rapid clip. They're stomping and their manure activate where soils really are created in the microbial community below the soil. Four-fifths of all organisms in the world are nematodes. They live below the, the surface of the earth. The uh, activity there is uh, just replete, just amazing. And what is happening is the carbon exchange. So right now we have too much carbon in the atmosphere and too much carbon in the oceans, not enough in the soils. You actually can't have too much carbon in the soils. And that's the currency that that microbial community recognizes. So as plants are photosynthesizing, they are reaching down and offering carbon to the uh, occupants of the uh, soil, which are traveling along the microrhizomal highways, and those are mostly microbes, uh, searching out uh, minerals that those plants need in order to exchange them for the carbon. They take the carbon, uh, some of it they process in a way that transpires in the, the annual setting, but a lot of it go becomes durable carbon in the soil. The animals move along, inspiring that activity and, and providing resource in those manures. And uh, also, uh, as they go along, the birds provide a symbiosis of picking off the main predator, the main uh, parasitic pathogens. Uh, by eating the eggs that are laid in the animal's manure. They move so fast, they don't get a lot of the pathogens. 
they move down the cycle, and then when the rains turn around, they move, turn around and they go right back up it. And voila, those are the richest soils in the world. So taking that, nature is our model. Nature is always our model. Nature does magnificently. We don't need to do better. We just need to find a way to scale nature so that we can feed American populations where they are in working lands. And that's enough for me for right now. Thank you, Kat. That was fascinating. Joan, um, if you could address the uh, very novel approach that you're pursuing to significantly reduce livestock methane emission. Sure. And to, to thank you all for being here, and thank you for having both of us here. I'm really honored to be here. And you're right. This is an area where, where Kat and I have very similar interests and, mm -hmm. and values. Um, in the work that, that I am leading, we too are seeking natural solutions um, to uh, an issue that is a natural problem, to be perfectly honest. So uh, kind of understanding how systems work together, how the carbon cycle works, and all that drives my work as well. So in addition to, uh, to cows being very effective climate warriors who are capable of sequestering more and more carbon into the soil, they also have this unfortunate habit, uh, which was created by Mother Nature, which is that in that ruminating stomach that Kat talked about, methane is formed and burped out. Um, it is mostly burps, by the way, not, not the other end. But at any rate, uh, burps come out. And uh, you know methane is uh, very, very potent uh, greenhouse gas, um, many times more trapping of, of heat than carbon dioxide. And um, in fact, the cows all over the world, if, if you took all of their, their methane annually, they would be burping about the same global warming as maybe 590 million cars, twice as many cars as we have in the United States. So it's a, it's a substantial issue, and it really is just about the design of the animal. Um, but uh, in Australia, there was a group of, of uh, farmers and researchers who, uh, who do practice kind of regenerative grazing and, and kind of moving their cows around in order to properly disrupt but also to clip and, and to sequester uh, carbon in the soil, there were certain months of the year when that really wasn't practical because of climate, that the quality of forage was, was yucky. However, great news, Australia is a coastal uh, nation and there's plenty of grass growing in the sea. So they pulled some of the seaweed out of the, out of the ocean and lo and behold, over a period of some time, an accident was discovered, which is a natural solution which is that a particular red seaweed has in it specialized cells that have some bioactive compounds that when fed to cows in very small amounts almost completely wipes out the methane from digestion, almost completely. So this happened in Australia, uh, but we here in the Bay Area became curious, is this a little fluke that only can happen in Australia? Uh, you know, is there something particular about those breeds, their feedstock, whatever? So um, I formed a, uh, a nonprofit at that moment to raise some uh, money for a proof of concept to bring this idea to light and to really explore whether uh, in the U.S. context we could achieve some of the same uh, results in terms of the methane mitigation, but also really look hard at the system impacts. What else is happening? with the animal? What else is happening to the milk products or meat products that are made by that animal? What's happening to the soil? What's happening to the fecal matter of that animal, et cetera, et cetera? So we're in the middle of um, that process and about to pivot into another stage of our um, incarnation as uh, out of the nonprofit uh, scenario and into a for-profit enterprise, uh, but it's it's really based on also natural systems that reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of livestock production. Thank you. Very interesting. You are both um, role models for many women, and I'm wondering if you could each describe pivotal moments on the journey that brought you to where you are, in particular uh, where you have basically become advocates for uh, social innovation and sustainability. I'll take something quick, sure. Um, so as, uh, as Stacy mentioned, I was with Accenture. I was a managing director for Accenture for 20 years and uh, was kind of an early uh, member of that practice as a woman and one of the very first managing directors um, 
as a woman. And so I became very uh, interested not only in serving our most important clients, but in uh, uh, institutionalizing some mentoring for, for women in Accenture to kind of continue to, to keep the pipeline going. And I formed a global uh, consult, uh, mentoring program for women for the banking group that I was a part of and traveled a great deal, meeting with women and trying to help them brainstorm issues they might have with getting the right assignments or, or finding the right mentors or any of those kinds of things. And I loved meeting these women. They were from great universities like the ones that Kat went to and et cetera. And However, over dinner with these women, or over a cup of coffee, many times I discovered that, you know, coming in in their 35th year or in their 37th year, <coughs> I was noticing that they had not really learned how to embrace risk in a successful way, or they were afraid to ask for help in a constructive way. A number of things that I really wish they had learned when they were in high school or in junior high school. And at that time, um, Atlanta, which is where I lived, was launching a new college prep girls school. And the purpose of that school was to be to push young women and girls into areas of discomfort by design yeah. and to give them a, an opportunity to do things that were very hard uh, whether they were in leadership or public speaking or in <coughs> STEM or other kinds of things. And I just thought this was great. It, you know, the, it had the potential to be a totally different way of these young women to, to see failure and to see growth and all these kinds of things. And um, so I became a, an angel investor in that school and a mentor at that school. And finally, uh, in my 20th year at Accenture, mm -hmm. I said, you know, this school is innovating. It is changing the social landscape. It is going to change the trajectory of a lot of girls' lives, and I want to be more a part of that. So I left Accenture to go and earn the English and, uh, and education degree that allowed me to get more involved in the lives of those girls. And I'm, that was a real turning point. Yeah, sounds like it. Cat, pivotal so moment. So glad you did that. I <laughs> So I am too. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, because um, I, I don't think anyone needs to be sort of a genderist to notice what's actually going on, which is that for uh, time immemorial, the female of the species not having the might makes right, not have not being the dominant from a strength standpoint, had to develop a lot of skills that are now much in demand much in demand because they are the skills of collaboration and cooperation and coordination, political skills, et cetera. Um, when people come to my husband to ask for advice, men his age, he always tells them to act more like a woman. And he, he, he doesn't mean that as a genderist statement either, but it is, this is a time when, when you know, we're two degrees away from climate disaster and uh, our economic solutions are not averting social chaos when every market and every sector is failing us, essentially, we have to think of something new. And it really has to do with how we're all going to get along and not be spit out by the planet like a watermelon seed, because it doesn't really need us. So all those skills being at a premium, they nonetheless, the flip side of that coin is I think um, the very same group through evolution who has um, you know, developed, cultivated those skills, there's a, a, an ameliorative or an accommodationist um, kind of instinct that comes with it to go along and get along, which it doesn't serve us in many settings. Uh, first and foremost, seeking venture funding, let's put it straight. Um, so I would say, I, I started out with a, um, a, a natural inclination towards social enterprise. And mostly what that means to me is I seek multi-stakeholder models. I'm not looking for a transactional approach, pr approach between two parties because it always fails. It's sitting in a larger context. It's just fooling itself for a while. You could think of it sort of like we're on a 100-year um, chess, chess board, uh, but right now the spoils go to who wins the next move. The next move is not going to win the game. The next move is just going to win some spoils in the short term. So how do we get the time frame and the perspective of the whole chess game? It's through a multi-stakeholder model. One of the ways that does that is um, if we think of the next generation, or preferably the next seven generations, then we start 
taking into account everybody who's affected by every decision we make. So the bank is, has a multi-stakeholder model. It's serving not just the equity shareholder, it's serving probably first and foremost the depositors mm -hmm. because that's the lion's share of our funding. It's the most powerful f funding because it's very low cost, 50 basis points, and it leverages our equity capital at least 10 to one. So if you're familiar with financial models that have operating leverage, that's magic. That's just magic. So we should actually be more concerned about what our depositors think than our equity shareholders. They hold more of the cards. We, by the way, we also serve our customers, communities, the planet, the public at large, because banking is a quasi-public system, and it should serve those interests. Um, I had a conversation this morning with several of the groups that I work with about mutualism. I'm over enlightened self-interest. It still has self-interest in it. It isn't working. We've tried it for a long time. It's crashing the planet. So mutualism to me means that we take actions as if everybody knows that we took that action. We're reputationally on the hook for that. And we hope that everyone else takes actions with us in mind. Uh, it's a multi-stakeholder model. We now have devices that will help us do that in how we photograph, shop, invest, and vote. And I'm not even talking electoral politics, I'm talking like voting proxies. If we all used our phone to communicate through photos, which it's, that's, you know, a picture is a thousand words, things going on around us, and we banded together and had community uh, sort of packs about how we shop, don't shop for things that are actually working against you, don't invest in things that are working against you, don't uh, vote your proxies, whether that's in a company setting or the electoral politics in ways that are against you, we have an opportunity to create a network effect. The internet is nothing without us. If we all used our power to boycott, to withhold, we could shut down the internet. But we, don't, we aren't yet coordinated to do that. So the very 99% who feels like it has no power actually has the utmost power. If we all get together and coordinate into PACs, we can, so in electoral politics, which has had a negative network effect for the last 40 years, what has happened is, when the bell curve of opinion shows up, we get a good result. When the bell curve doubts that the middle is going to show up, only the tails show up. And then we have an inner Nicene war between two extremes and wonder why we have to live with either. But none of the middle of the bell curve is convinced that the best of the bell curve is going to show up. If we reverse that, that's a network effect like the phone system, like the internet. And now because we have smartphones in almost everyone's hands and massive computing power, and the ultimate in transparency, we can create a network commitment to show up as the middle of the bell curve and actually get the ends that would be good for everybody at once in a multi-stakeholder model. So sorry to sound so sort of theoretical, but I actually think it's really important. I'll t give you an antithesis of it, privatization. Privatization sometimes helps us experiment, charter schools. Really good way to experiment. But it's not good in the main. It's a single transaction between two parties, and it leaves everyone else out. So if you privatize prisons, bridges, schools, elections, you don't get good outcomes for everybody. So I'm all in for multi-stakeholder mutualism. I'd like to uh, ask a question. This I think this will have to be our last question, just because we want to get to the panel as well. Um, I want to turn back to entrepreneurship, and I'm wondering if, um, based on your experience, how can an entrepreneur decide when the time is right to launch her own venture and with whom, who, who to launch with? I imagine some people have that question in yeah. the audience. Well, a general thought that I have on that is um, that the best way to launch is in a way where you launch and launch again and launch, launch, and you're continually learning through each step. Um, you know, the lean launch pad methodology often used um, here at Stanford is a great example of that, where you identify, you know, kind of through a business model canvas where the greatest risks or unknowns are. And, you, and without a formal launch, you head right in there and either develop a you know, tiny prototype, or you visit directly with the stakeholders, you, you pencil out the key risks in that area, and you go from that one to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And you are kind of uh, waltzing ever so slowly into being the entrepreneur that you uh, 
see yourself as, and without you know kind of putting everything out there in a you know just a big uh, big bang kind of launch. And so um, I know that with the work I've been doing, I've been leveraging a great deal of non dilutive capital, that is philanthropic capital, to you know uh, explore around the edges of this innovation before I you know really. Uh, head out with, uh, with the go-to-market uh, answer. So my thought would be, if you can uh, launch over time in kind of an elegant little uh, wave, wave motion, I'd try to do that. Okay. So I asked my colleagues, because they're way more experienced at Radical, uh, we are dominantly female, younger entrepreneurs, former entrepreneurs, now investors. And they had some really good answers, um, which I recognize because we do practice them. Mm -hmm. But um, they said, you know, I, the numbers in venture are just the most dismal for gender parity. They're really quite pathetic. Um, and there are practices that we can see are uh, causative of that. And one of them is that most female pitches get interrupted by a question. I think it's something like within 90 seconds of launch. Mm -hmm. So you, if you can't beat them, join them. So what they are counseling a lot of women, until we change that ethic, they are saying anticipate that question and let the question launch your pitch. So it, think about what are they going to, and the question's likely going to be something to try to shut you down, like to just make the pitch end quickly. So they're going to go for your Achilles heel, figure out what it is, and have a really good answer that allows you to tell the rest of the narrative. I'm sorry to say such a sort of negative thing, but we're in migration to a better system. So we might as well be wise about how to approach it. Um, the other thing is uh, to have lots of proof points before you go to market. I think this is true for any entrepreneur. Um, venture still is just not, it's not the kind of risk capital that is ready not to see where the payback is. Like the revenues, the contracts, the whatever it is that, show, that they can write down on paper and say, here's the break even, here's where we start to make money even in the impact space, maybe even especially in the impact space. Um, and so you have to do two things at once. You have to get yourself ready to raise money, and you have to work on sales. You just have to have some sales. Don't go in there without ink on the line. And then the last thing is um, I encourage people, and they do too, to go towards alternative sources of capital. Um, when you open the aperture and make the problem bigger, the solution set gets bigger too. And you will find more resources and more constituencies of support that way. And you can articulate the impact beyond financial. You still have to show the financial, but if you can show transformative impact, social or environmental, you're going to garner an audience with some of the new impact capital that's pretty exciting and is quite willing and ready to be non-traditional. Thank you both for great advice. Um, we're going to now turn to the next portion of the event. I want to mention that we're going to have time at the end of the afternoon uh, for the audience to ask all the speakers questions. But uh, please, now let's just take a moment to thank Kat and Joan. Yeah.